Hello and welcome to the K-Scope podcast. Billy Reeves here, I trust you're well. Anathema are back. The Optimist, the new album, following on conceptually speaking from 2001's A Fine Day to Exit album. Daniel and Vincent Kavanagh coming up in this podcast. But to start with, from the current album, this is Anathema, Leaving It Behind. leaving it behind from The Optimist and at this stage in their career I thought it was important to speak to more than one Kavanagh brother well let's let them introduce themselves Hello I'm Vincent and I sing My name's Danny, I'm a songwriter and piano guitar I'm quite scared 
And I'll tell you for why, is A, stuck in a small room with a couple of beefy Kavanaars. Yes. But also, I'm very nervous about this tour. Now, this is, before we start talking about Alan, this is, well, it's, it's several tours. In mine, it's absolutely enormous. How on earth are six people going to spend eight, nine, ten, eleven months on the road travelling the entire world going to stay sane, Vincent? Um combination of greens and good sleep if you can right. get it I don't think about what we're doing until the day before we do it the only thing I've ta- thought about is uh, um, what the light show might look like alright ok so the kind of production yeah side yeah I've yeah. thought about that a bit you know and what we were doing the Bataclan in Paris because that, that really All affected right, yeah. me you know other than that I haven't given it two minutes though that, seem, that seems wise to me to sort of like yeah. not, you know, not worry about it too much how did it come about then was it a case of Vincent speaking to management, speaking to tour uh, promoters and saying, right, we, we just want to tour the hell out of this record, or is the tour in itself, in and of itself, a money spinner? Are you a working band or are you just promoting the record here? Promoting the record is like doing interviews. Doing this is promoting okay. the record. But playing live is playing live. is a totally different thing. I mean, for a start, our plan is to, maybe not initially, but by the time we get on tour in the autumn and start doing the full European tour and um, is to play the f- album in full. Okay, you know, so at that point it'll be um, a visual show. You know, with a, a story. You know, we won't even we won't even look up from our instruments to talk to the audience right. at that point. You know, it's going to be a performance. So the first hour will be that. Then we'll have a short break and we'll carry on and, and play some other big songs. So that's that doesn't feel like promotion to me. That feels like that feels like a, a challenge and it feels like fun. Okay, um, let's talk about the creative process for writing the record then before we move on to the recording of it, Vincent. Is that something that everybody brings ideas to the table? We spoke about that briefly last time I spoke to you. How did the songwriting process work with this record? I moved from Paris, I think. Like, that was a that was a big deal. Mm. Like, moving here and uh, found a, an empty rehearsal room, if you right. like, that was soundproofed. Set up my studio gear... I think it took me a few days and called Danny and said, all right, Dan, I'm set up, you know, come down. Okay. So Danny... Because Danny's this, in London as well. Yeah, so yeah. me and him being in the same city, yeah. that was... Also, aside to that, like, I mean, what's what I, I felt was really important since then, um, which I noticed, is that mine and Danny's relationship improved since I moved to the city. Okay. And I think um, having that sort of... Ha- being in close close proximity and being able to see each other socially enabled us to just form a bit more of a better bond because for years and years especially while I was living abroad we only ever saw each other while there was something to do with the band it was a gig yeah. or whatever you know and whereas now all of a sudden we're just hanging out yeah. and okay let's go to the studio and we'll go to the studio and you know we'll spend a couple of hours and we'll listen to a bunch of Danny so Danny had something like I don't know dozens and dozens and dozens mm-hmm. of different ideas and the first one that stuck out was The Optimist the title track yeah. Um, there was something about that. So we started working on that one first, and that one came together quite quickly. Danny was just in the mood that day, and I captured it, really. And he came up with the title. And then after that, you know, like we, we would work in that way for a while. It was fun. It was easy. It was, like, close by to my house. So mm-hmm. after we'd finished work in the evening, we'd walk up to my house and... We watched the football. Liverpool were on a, right. a European run at the time, so it was it was kind of cool. We'd go to our place and you know we'd you know get a pizza in, watch the football and all of that, and it was and it was fun, you know, to hang out and and to make, make music in that way without any kind of like you know usually making an album in the studio, writing the writing the music in the studio, yeah, and so true. this point doing it like way in advance was was really freeing, I think, and it just kind of it made it easier. Then John would come down with his stuff and I'd work on that. Okay. A few songs down the line and Danny come up with the concept of, mm. well, the story a- angle for um, following on from the, the cover of A Fine Day to Exit and the artwork for that. Mm. And because we already had the title of The Optimist, it was perfect, really. So talk us through the concept then, Danny, because there does seem to be a kind of like uh, a binding together of the material this time. Mm. Uh, I look at... I looked at the um, song with the optimist and the the, vi- the image that that started with because most of the songs for me started with an image this time, okay. and that one started with with a car driving at night mm. and a theme of escape. And I thought, well, you know, that's not bad. And then uh, it's it's a very small leap to get from a car driving at night to then go, well, where's he going? Where's he going? You know, 
what's he trying to escape from, where's he trying to go to, mm. and then you start to fill in those blanks. And then um, the final thing was, you know, you've only got to look at the cover for a fine day to exit, which mm. for anyone who doesn't know us or know the album, it's a, it's a car on a beach. Yeah, it's quite stark, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's a guy, the, the idea was that there was this um, this person who, who left the scene, with it, left his car and mm. wandered into the sea and nobody knew what happened to him. Well, you know, I thought, well, you know, you could maybe got back in the car and drove off, and it did, mm. that was it then. And well, then it was just the Reggie Perrins. Yeah. I, I, I also, I, I wonder if also that if you're it's certain expectations, Danny, I think of Anathema. There's a certain sound, there's a certain image, yeah. but this time working within that framework, it's almost like you've done the most luxurious and the most luxuriant record you can do. Listening to, I've listened to the great honour of listening to it. That I got a copy of it, and it's like. It's like being in a sort of like really kind of sumptuous apartment, sitting in an uncomfortable chair. Mm. That's that's how I felt. That's, through, nice. that's, that's how like sitting in a Bauhaus chair, and that's how I felt about it. What, what, did it did it take a huge amount of time and a huge amount of money? Because it sound if it had been made yeah. in the seventies, it would have cost a like a million quid. Well, yes and yes, <laughs> it did <laughs> cost a lot of time. Quality products. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, including the budget is also the the nine months in London first okay. before we went to Scotland. And then uh, we, um, Andy, I think I'd, that's the manager, Andy had uh, recommended this uh, Scots producer to us. Okay. And he'd done Mogwai a lot. That's just Tony Dugan. Yeah. The Doog. Yeah. So uh, we thought, well, you know, that sounds good. Mm. So we'll have a, got, him on, got him on the phone and he was good, wasn't he? So yeah. he said yes to it, luckily for us. And um, we then proceeded to uh, drive him mad. <laughs>
There's a, a, a little difference to your singing, Vincent, this time. I'm not sure what it is. It's a close mic technique. You're not belting it out. It's a little bit more sexy this time. Would that be, uh, would that be fair? Sexy? Yeah, I think so. Wow. Saucy. Saucy. Yeah, yeah, there is a bit, actually, it where I think it? he's like that. And I forget what song you want is want me to talk about how well, sexy my voice well, no, is? Well, just, was that a deliberate thing? Well, there's a double tracking thing as well, I think, which helped. Uh-huh. The vocals uh-huh. being double tracked uh-huh. as well. It's the uh-huh. Scottishness. It's, it's right. Scotland has, has this effect on you, especially Tony so Dugan. The Heather. He just makes you feel sexy. Right, OK. Was it a deliberate thing, though? Did you think the material suited, you know, being a little bit more I didn't think soft? about it. Really? I just did it. One of the best things about this record for me personally is that you can, if you stream the album or if you buy it on iTunes or whatever, you'll get it. You know, you'll get most of the picture. You'll get like, you know, a good, uh, eventually you'll get it. But really, you should get the physical package because the the, the real companion piece to the music, really. Yeah, it's true. Well, I think it's, imp- it's important. I, I think there's that, that's one thing I've said many times before. Daniel, that K-Scope do provide music as premium product. Yeah, it was it's good. Not it was good doing the album with Travis, and mm. um, he also like became the character in the film for a bit. Right. You know, because uh, he drove from San Diego, which is where for, he took the he did the artwork years ago for Find Day Two Exes, okay. and he took that from cover on the beach near his house. So he um, he started there with this one, and then recreated like the shots from that album, and then. Drove up the highway, you know. Right. All up, up now, finally, for me, I've, I've I've interviewed you together once. It was in a cafe two albums ago in Soho. I've interviewed you separately six times, five times, and you both separately and together usually say the same thing to me at the end of it, which is, "We want to make the greatest album that we possibly can. We haven't done it yet, right?" So, Vincent, have you done? Have you done? <laughs> no. <laughs> have no. you done it yet? Well, no, I don't think so. No, I, I think this is all I ever really hope for, especially when once we've completed something. Is is it actually finished? Is it complete? Is it? Does it feel as if um, there's not a lot of a lot that we would do to change it? It's now a couple of months f- since we finished it, mm. and to me, there's probably a couple of things I would change, um, okay. but they're not nothing major, you know, yeah. in hindsight. But it must be so, it must be There's so a few, a few that, small or... things, but like, but then we worked on everything on this in the most fine detail until the mm. very last minute, you know, right up until the master, and until you eventually got to let it go. And mm. I think at this point, to 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 carry on work on it after after the music was finished, doing the artwork with Travis, doing the live show, putting these these films and visuals together that we're doing at the moment, is really. Um, Something we've never done before. Okay, so it feels like so in that se- in that sense, I would say it's a way more complete sort of cross okay. discipline, cross platform yeah. work that we've never done before. It's much more of a visual story than something we've okay. never done before. So, I, but that only it spares me on to do something bigger and better next time. Okay, just that, what's your relationship? I don't know. With honestly, I, I I wonder if we'll beat this, like you know. Mm. But uh, I think we were better prepared, prepared this time. Yeah, but I, I, I remember. Yeah, yeah. I remember it being mm. about May, June last year, like a couple of months into the demos, and I thought everything I'd written was absolute crap. <laughs> All of it was just utter shite. And like it ended up being okay in the end. Mm. And I have absolutely no idea what the next album's going to be like. But I didn't know what this one was going to be like. That's interesting because, again, often, not so much you, but often you say, uh, yeah, I know what the re- next record's going to sound like. I have like. a clue. I've got more of an idea about the, what the next record's going to sound like than Danny well come on then give us a clue disco no oh, okay. <laughs> everything in 4-4 four, four. No. Okay, so <laughs> that's two exclusives for you there dear listener it's not going to be disco and that's it's not, not going to be in 4-4 four, four. Yeah. Uh, Daniel <laughs> and Vincent thank you very much thank indeed you very for joining much, us really. nice to see you again
From the new album, The Optimist, out now. Before that, you heard Can't Let Go, and there's a 360 degree virtual reality video for that track coming soon. Keep an eye out on the K Scope music channels and the band's channels. And before that, you heard Leaving It Behind. Now, as intimated in that interview, plenty of live dates coming up for Anathema. On June the 30th, a Be a Prog, my friend, a festival, and then Southern and North American dates through August. UK dates have just been announced. There's a European tour from September to November, and then the band are going to Australia in December. More information, kscopemusic.com forward slash ANA. Some other live dates for your diary. The Pineapple Thief, September European dates featuring Gavin Harrison on drums once again, and Godsticks in support. Richard Barbieri plays the Church of St Margaret of Antioch in Liverpool on the 29th of September. That should be pretty special. This time he'll be joined by Luca Calabresi as well as Leeson Rylander Love. Tesseract, later this month and into July, the band will be on tour with Megadeth and Miss Sugar and are also doing some shows of their own in Indianapolis, Nashville, Memphis, Buffalo and Amityville. And Paul Draper's first solo tour starts in September. It's almost sold out. I understand there's a few tickets left for the Birmingham date. And this is in support of Draper's first ever solo album, Spooky Action, which is coming out on K-Scope on August the 11th. And Draper was the frontman of Manson, arguably one of the most iconic bands of the late 90s. 
who managed to maintain critical and commercial success with a series of radio-friendly yet increasingly experimental records. And off of the back of their biggest radio record, Manson imploded in 2003. And Paul all but disappeared from view. He ran a studio for a little while, but now he's back. Spooky action, the result of a decade of thinking, fiddling, tinkering, writing, recording, and finally focusing lyrically. I'd say brutally honest, autobiographical, one could argue, set to captivating, addictive melodies across 11 songs that peak and then peak again, just rammed with hooks, taking its cue from last year's two EP releases, a lot of it recorded in collaboration with Catherine Ann Davis, who K-Scope fans will know better as the anchoress and longtime Manson collaborator P-Dub. Going to play a track from Spooky Action. This is called Don't Poke the Bear.
Noel Draper from Spooky Action, Don't Poke the Bear. Right, I'm going to finish with a little porcupine tree. K-Scope have reissued Porcupine Tree's debut album on the Sunday of Life on blue vinyl and Up the Downstair on purple vinyl, both remastered by Stephen Wilson and exclusive for HMV. Refreshingly original, a wonderful musical adventure, record collector said of Sunday of Life. Deadly seducing stuff, said the enemy 1991 you've got to go back to for on the sunday of life an album which stands up as a modern day pop psych classic now a double lp pressed on 180 gram heavyweight blue vinyl you'll be able to unveil an album of surreal delight as soon as the stylus hits the vinyl containing gems such as jupiter island linton samuel dawson quirky melody trippy backwards guitar work Great effects on the vocals. Nine Cats, in my opinion, the masterpiece of the album. Pure Edward Lear psychedelia. Porcupine Tree. Nine Cats. See you soon. Ta-da. A butterfly sailing on the breeze Past a field of barbed wire trees Where golden dragons chased around Puppies on the ground to sow the traps sat way on high and watched a royal samurai and two black orchids in a bar and strap it to a laughing. Fox, a minstrel bought a crooked spoon. He gave it to a blue Bible who filled it full of virgin snow. Oh, oh, oh. 